Okay, so um, I'm very, very upset about the recent attack by the DEA on Dr. Forrest Tennant, which we all know, anyone who knows him as a physician or doctor or pain specialist knows that he would not do anything illegal. In fact, I've had plenty of correspondence with him. Um, where, you know, he completely goes by the guidelines. He tries to find alternative things to help. He wants to help uh, people that have chronic intractable pain. And, you know, as he says, most of his patients are near death. They're in such awful pain. Um, I'm having a really rough day today, so excuse my appearance here. But anyway, um, so... I'm really upset. But anyway, so I'm doing this video because of the people who don't understand me, who I am and what I went through. And I just want to kind of give you an idea, a picture of who I am and what I'm going through, what I've gone through, what I uh, am, am doing here. So back in 1986, when I was barely 18 years old, 95 pounds. I was hit by a drunk driver in this van, okay? That is actually the correct position it landed in. That's not me holding it sideways. This van was a steel van, a very old van, and look at even the top is ripped off. I was hooked onto that van and it took me for a tumble okay it tore me apart I shouldn't even be alive today I had multiple injuries during my time in the hospital this is me back in 1986 about a, uh, well that was let's see the date on this is August 20th that was about a month later my my accident was on uh, July 23rd, so approximately one month later, this is me laying in the hospital bed still. I was in for three months. Uh, so these pictures were taken by the police department for my case. Um, I had multiple injuries, including uh, my, my left hand was crushed. I had pins in it and whatnot. Uh, I don't know. If you can see, uh, they're just kind of showing the it was still bruised and battered even a month later. I don't know if you can see right here, my leg was in traction there. Um, for the entire three months I was in the hospital, I had a pin going through my leg. My, my leg was torn off. I was missing two inches of bone and I was uh, in traction. They had a, a, a screw going through my knee. Um, that's also another photo of my hand. They just want to show all the bruising at that point. So during that time, um, I had what you call uh, a vertical shear fracture of the pelvis. This is a vertical shear fracture. That's one photo of it. I have another one. It basically means that it's completely broken. Let's see if I can hold it here. Completely broken here and on the bottom in both places there. So I was split in half completely. My leg, as I was telling you, was ripped to shreds. This is what my leg looked like before they did surgery, after they brought me in this is my leg so as as you can see that's very bad uh, I was then taken into the hospital or gone into surgery they put the uh, they put the pelvic brace on me this is what the pelvic brace would look like uh, as you can see there um, they put pins in your hip and they vice your hip back together now that of course that's not me I just I don't have a photo of that I was 
very uncomfortable at the time and I didn't want them to take pictures of it. Uh, my skin was ripped apart at the, at the point in my hips where they screwed those pins in and I was just very embarrassed to show them my pelvic brace. But that is a similar one to what they did to vise my pelvis back together. They did vise it back together quite crooked. Um, and I have some photos of my x-rays here that were done recently that still show the fracture and how crooked I am. My pelvic is not at all straight. I, I have a horrible crookedness to my body as you can see. My pelvic does not meet up properly. My hips are indented. I don't have hips like normal people. They're gone from the pins. And my spine, of course, is absolutely damaged. My tailbone is damaged. And I just don't have a normal pelvic. Um, these x-rays are, you know, that was a very current x-ray. Um, during my time in the hospital, they attempted a procedure that was experimental called a bone graft. Here's a picture, an example of a bone graft. Basically that is a human bottom. This is the back of the pelvic. They opened me up here and they chipped bone from the back of my, my pelvic, my, by my back here. And they did that to uh, put it into my leg to try to stimulate the two inches of bone growth that was uh, missing. Now, this is the scarring and what is currently left uh, in my back here. That is the scar from that and my back, what it looks like from that procedure. It is not healed correctly and it hurts terribly. Now, well, the reason they did that was to chip the bone away to put it in my leg. As you can see, there are chips of bone. I don't know if I can do it from here. There are chips of bone here because I was missing two inches of my femur. They tried to place the chips of bone from my uh, my the back of me to put in here to stimulate growth while it was in traction however it didn't work so instead they put this plate and bolt in its place left the shards of bone there and this is what I now have in my leg permanently which is very painful in the knee area I don't know if you can see but that's all that's left below my knee just a little teeny bit there and it's very very rough it's not a very good um, it basically was broken that way and they just covered it up they didn't even smooth the tip out right here they didn't uh, let's see if we can get a shot of that they didn't even sh smooth the tip of the bottom of my of my stump there so it's very rough um, and uh, so I'm left with that. Now, recently they did another x-ray, uh, of course, of my pelvic and uh, my hip. And here, because I'm having a lot of pain there in my pelvic area and back area, uh, it's really in bad shape. The plate's still in there and um, yeah, my, my back and my pelvic area are, are a mess. And uh, they, I had to print these out from my, my x-rays because um, I just had to. <laughs> so uh, this is what's remaining still. This is what uh, I'm left with as far as the leg goes. Now, on top of these injuries, 
one year later, on July the 20th, 1987, I had my son Brian. I had a baby. I didn't even have a prosthetic leg yet. I wasn't even completely healed yet. But I was determined to fight, and I was so happy to have my baby. And it didn't matter to me. I was going to be strong and take care of this child. So I fought my way through. Now, uh, on top of all these injuries and everything, I still fought and I did the best that I can. I really did. So my point is, I live now 32 years later almost here. I, I live in a state of horrible intractable pain. So those weren't my only injuries. I also had a broken arm. Um, I don't have the x-ray of that at this time. But uh, so far, see all my records got destroyed in the Northridge earthquake. So um, they don't really have that. So I have some diagnoses here that I can tell you some of the conditions. So they say that now over time I have bilateral uh, radiation leg pain, tendonitis of the right rotator cuff, uh, of course right shoulder pain. This is from overuse of my right arm over the years because my left arm was bad. I have severe hip pain on my left side. Um, I have low back pain, uh, chronic pain, puritis of history of below the knee amputation. These are just the diagnoses. Um, I will get to my actual conditions here. Uh, ulnar, ulnar neuropathy at my wrist, which is why I have to wear this wrist brace so I can't bend my wrist anymore. Uh, because the fra my hand being crushed, it has fused together and grown extra stuff on there, and it's actually so painful. It, it radiates through my fingers. I have uh, so much pain there as well. Um, I have insomnia, of course. I also have GERD, um, which is from having uh, my valve in my and my esophagus doesn't close properly so when I eat food the food goes down my stomach acids begin to process and they come back up there's no valve to close behind it and over time that has destroyed my esophagus so um, I have the the GERD I have esophagitis I have nausea I have nausea and vomiting I also have allergic reactions to certain non-opioid medications and some opioid medication not not allergic reactions but bad reactions to some of the opioid medications like um, certain ones make me really loopy and tired I don't like that so uh, but I also have allergic reactions to uh, medications like Lyrica and Celebrex they've tried uh, other things that they've tried on me that just gave me really bad allergic reactions so I have those. I also have allergic reactions to other medications that have nothing to do with opiates. So I, I carry an EpiPen. I'm also allergic to bees, so uh, I have that. I have bicep tendonitis. Um, I have uh, py pylonephritis, abdominal pain. I have uh, sinusitis and a debulcalotus uh, decubitis de, 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 de ulcer so those are the those are those but uh, so actually my my conditions are bilateral radiation leg pain bursitis of the right shoulder tendonitis of the right rotator cuff impingement um, syndrome of right shoulder right shoulder pain irritability obviously because of my pain um, I do have dub which doesn't need to be explained other to the, uh, except for to the women it's a dysfunctional uterine bleeding um, which you understand I have really bad periods in other words and uh, it's very painful and awful um, I have uh, 
dysmenorrhea, refractive error. Um, I have hip pain, oh, they already said that. Low back pain, chronic pain due to trauma, uncomplicated opioid dependence. Encounter for long-term or current use of medications, they have that under control. Chronic pain, because intractable pain's not on the book. Anxiety, which is from uh, just overwhelming stress with my pain and with uh, the accident itself. Puritis, post-traumatic stress disorder, obviously. When I get in vehicles with other people, I don't trust them driving. History of the below the knee amputation, osteoarthritis of the left hand, ulnar neuropathy at the at the wrist, hand pain. Um, I have insomnia, tendonitis of the left shoulder. Um, I have the nausea, nausea and vomiting, allergic reactions to certain drugs, acute sinusitis, uh, bicep tendonitis. I have. Uh, those things that I already uh, mentioned uh, uh, injuries of multiple sites I have a fractured history of a fractured pelvis history of amputation of the leg I have um, let's see here uh, arthritis tendonitis I have uh, where's the other ones here oh here they are so I also have uh, root nerve impingement, degenerative discs, um, several of them, scoliosis. Uh, I have uh, arthritis in my left hand, arthritis in my right hand, arthritis in my knee, uh, and then of course the tendonitis in my shoulders. Um, uh, my doctor has said that I am developing uh, the tendonitis and arthritis in my hips because of the um, pelvic stuff and we haven't even gone through uh, diagnosing everything yet because it takes forever to rebuild your documentation and that is a horrible thing so I just wanted you to get to know a little bit about me. Um, I am very upset over the attack. I should be on palliative care. I spend my days in bed. I did become a minister. I'm very proud of that because I do believe in God and I do believe that God saved me. So I am clergy now and um, and just unfortunately, I am being put out of, of being able to do that due to my pain. I can't get out of bed very much. I'm, I'm a patient who has a condition that should be under palliative care. And uh, unfortunately, they can't get palliative care to me here. Therefore, there is a prejudice and a, and a bias in the system right now, which I am going to now have to fight even harder. Since the uh, DEA's attack on Dr. Tennant, uh, we're going to have to fight harder and harder. It seems to me that there's a big conspiracy now going on. Um, they're going to take the top doctors and pain specialists the ones who know about intractable pain, they're going to take them and they're going to attack them. And they're going to give, try to smear their name. Dr. Tennant has done nothing wrong. Uh, he has been in practice for a very long time and he has helped many patients. Most of his patients are like me, barely can get out of bed, uh, barely can do anything. I, I'm in a lot of pain right now. It's really hard to even concentrate. Uh, but basically, w the only way that we're going to get anything done is an outcry. We're done with this. They're attacking everybody and disregarding the severe intractable pain patient. So 
it is time now that we stand up and fight. We've got to contact news. We've got to contact people. If you are like me and you can't get out of bed and you're in severe pain all the time, I see my, my limbs go numb on me and they throb with pain. I can't sit here very long. This is killing me. But, uh, but if you have this kind of pain and it's constant and intractable and you have no access to the palliative care that you should be getting uh, where they're, they can handle taking care of you um, and there's no cure, there's no cure, there's a, as they say in their own words at the CDC, um, their, their own words, they talk about, let's see if I can find it, um, the CDC talks about, uh, let's see, okay, we have risk of suicide because of their guidelines, of course. Um, I have a, a thing that I just found uh, from the CDC, which was very, very interesting to me, I thought, because they talk about uh, the you know, in, improving the quality of life and palliative care. Um, and what they say here for palliative care, where's the little thing that I found here? Um, from the CDC, I just found something recently to this morning actually, uh, from the CDC about palliative care. Um, is this what it is? I have to find it. Uh, okay, ICSI healthcare guidelines. And it's basically just a a quote of what palliative care is. Um, and I just had it, maybe it's not, oh, here we go. So under the palliative care guidelines, Oh, this is an, a study on it. Okay, so we need to go back to... There, I have so much information I'm gathering for this fight. It's, it's insane. We're going to have to fight. This is killing me. I cannot... Ugh. I can't do this. Ugh. Trying to find the... CDC, the CDC uh, palliative care. Here it is, I think. Oh God, no, that's not it at all. Uh, Multiple disability. Um, here it is. Is this it? CDC. No, this is Program Collective Procedures. I have some old documentation from the CDC that contradicts itself um, for what's going on now, which is really important for us, uh, and and what's going on in the IPD co coding. Oh, here it is. Okay, so on the CDC's webpage, uh, they have a, a definition of palliative care, and it says here, palliative care is a general term that includes treatment given to relieve pain and control symptoms when there is no reasonable expectation of a cure. There is no reasonable expectation of a cure for me, period. I'm gonna be in this pain 
for the rest of my life. They don't have a cure for a cricket broken pelvic <laughs> pelvis. They don't have a cure for my scoliosis and my discs and, and my nerve root nerve impingement. They don't have any cure for any of this. Um, my my stuff is, is permanent and it's only going to get worse and I've been told that many times. Individuals with advanced chronic illnesses, which I have an advanced chronic pain permanent, uh, uh, advanced chronic multiple injuries that are just increasingly uh, worsening my conditions along the way with the shoulder, you know, tendonitis and all of that, bursitis and things that are, uh, they're getting worse as I go. So the older I get, the more I use any part of my body, the worse it gets, the more pain I'm in all the time. Uh, so it says, individuals with advanced chronic illnesses or life-limiting conditions will often benefit from pal palliative care. It focuses on the whole person, encompassing body, mind, and spirit to enhance comfort and preserve dignity. So this is as defined, this is a CDC thing, uh, as defined by the World Health Organization, palliative care provides relief from pain and other distressing symptoms, affirms life and regards dying as a normal process, intends neither to hasten or postpone death, integrates the psychological and spiritual aspects of patient care offers a support system to help patients live as actively as possible until death offers a support system to help the family cope during the patient's illness and in their own bereavement uses a team approach to address the needs of patients and their families including bereavement counseling if indicated will enhance the quality of life and may also positively influence the course of illness. It is applicable early in the course of the illness in conjunction with other therapies that are intended to prolong life, such as chemotherapy or radiation therapy. That's just an example and includes those investigations needed to better understand and manage distressing clinical complications. Okay, so that's their definition of what palliative care is. I fall under the category of in need of palliative care, as do many of these intractable pain patients. However, they have failed to make sure before they have done this whole nationwide attack on pain care they have failed to make sure that palliative care is available to people like me and others that are in such horrible pain that they can't do anything that they're stuck in in bed so what they've essentially done is violated our rights what they've essentially done is they have taken away our right to be treated for our intractable pain and forced us into a torturous suffering state. So we're going to need to fight back. We cannot let the media, the president, the CDC, the DEA, Department of Health and Human Services, who is leading off this, they even admit they don't have enough study on long-term use and uh, people that have this type of chronic condition they don't have enough study on that they're studying drug addicts and people who have a drug problem when they take you know they take this medication and they get addicted for small reasons they're, they're not studying true intractable pain patients and the long-term use and benefits of the long-term use of the opiates. They have left us in the cold, violating our civil and human rights, violating all of what they even put in place, their own, their own 
uh, statement that they're here to make sure that patients have the best care and the best quality of life they have betrayed us and the only way the only way that anything's going to get done is if we fight back now they know that we can't get out of bed we have to fight back another way we are going to have to get together somehow and we're going to have to be heard we need to get hold of news media we need to get together somehow we need to get hold of Washington we need to be seen and heard and they need to back off of good doctors who are helping patients like us just attacking them because they're prescribing high doses of medications to patients who really need it and have no other choice I have no other choice I am not gonna sit here and allow them to torture me for the rest of my life however long that may be or even kill me because they won't allow me to have the proper doses of pain medications and they won't allow me to get palliative care because they don't make sure palliative care is available they don't make sure that Medicare and Medicaid is covering palliative care doctors or that they're accepting them we don't have palliative care doctors we can't get them and I should be on palliative care I'm homebound bedbound most of the time because of my pain because of my chronic intractable pain I can't do anything when I do because I do have some medication yes a little bit of medication that helps a little bit but I'm still in so much pain even with that medication I have I, I have such a hard time for instance yesterday I got up I went and got gas with my caregiver I stopped at the, the store really quick for that and I came back home and just doing that I was in such severe pain I couldn't even move anymore the rest of the day and night this morning I could barely move now I'm taking this opportunity right now because I uh, I took medication but I'm hurting so bad just doing this but I wanted you guys to know me a little bit now I fought hard in that hospital in those conditions you saw those pictures and that's just a small part of what I had and went through you have no idea I went through torture and pain and I fought through it and I've been strong for many many years I didn't take a lot of medications for a long time I did take some I took lower doses for many years but my condition has gotten critically worse and I can't live like this anymore I can't do anything I can't even open a freaking jar anymore I used to be able to do that I can't I can't do anything anymore without being in severe pain running out of breath just from trying to hold my breath to get through a few steps because it hurts so bad and our rights have been violated so I don't know what we're gonna do yet I'm very upset about dr. Tennant I've got to get a hold of somebody who will listen we need to scream at the top of our lungs if we have to we need to get somebody's attention because they're violating our rights it is against the law what they're doing I'm gonna look into filing first I'm gonna file a complaint but then I'm going to look into filing a lawsuit. I'm going to try to get the media's attention. Now that they've done what they've done to Dr. Tennant, I've got to get a hold of the media. Somebody's going to listen to me. If I have to stand outside with my walker in severe pain, crying, screaming, whatever it takes for somebody to listen to me, I will do that. I have so much. I have files files and files thick files oh I have stuff all over my computer
things that the, the CDC and the DH, the Department of Health and Human Services have done wrong. They're not completely giving all the information and they don't have complete studies. And now the world is like going crazy on these overdoses, but they are not taking into consideration people like us who are in severe pain all the time. I can't do this anymore. I'm sorry. I'm hurting so bad. I wanted you to get to know me a little bit. I wanted you to see my injuries and see what it's about and know that I'm not okay. Even with the small amount of medication that I have, I'm not okay. And I am going to fight this. I'm doing everything I can. Yes, they attacked Dr. Tennant, but they didn't charge him with anything because he hasn't done anything wrong. If they do find something to charge him with, he needs to fight it. And I'm willing to stand up for him. Because I know for a fact, he's trying other things. He's not just prescribing opioids and all of that. And he stopped communicating with those people in 2015. So, yeah, back in those days, he was doing what every doctor does. There is a list, if you look, on every state, and and at the CDC, I think you can even find it, and the medical boards and stuff, there is a list, that they have a list of uh, how much money doctors get from each pharmaceutical company and everything for doing lunches and just promoting their medicines. And it happens for all kinds of medicines not just opiates but opiates are in there too and doctors get money all the time for speaking for doing seminars for going out to lunches and listening to them and for promoting their medications this is nothing new all doctors take these 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 uh payments for these things they're not kickbacks they're just payments for their you know time and and to listen to them and promote their medication for you know if they think it's good medication for their patients so if dr tennant used this medication it was for a good reason now maybe the pharmacy that was you know filling them wasn't doing the right thing i don't know but i'm telling you right now dr tennant did not ever intentionally do anything wrong or illegal we've discussed things and he stays by the book we know he does he tries to get alternatives to opiates the hormone therapies and things like that he tries to get to the root of the problem he's not just a drug pusher so the dea is attacking him only to smear his name because he is who he is because he is the top dog in pain management and because of this attack on opiates so you know what it's time for people to see the other side of the coin to see that pain patients the ones who don't overdose but who suffer in enormous amount of pain you know if they show somebody in the hospital with cancer or, or in severe pain like that people go oh give him medicine i feel so sorry for him but they they don't have a camera on us and we don't allow it when we're laying in bed suffering and screaming in pain and and trying to just live you know maybe we should maybe we should let them come in and put a camera on us 